Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. It's my privilege to be here today to talk about estimation. I've been studying estimation for over 30 years now, and uh, I've watched through time as people misestimated, uh, sometimes intentionally, many times accidentally, uh, sometimes because they had no no better idea, and sometimes just because they they just hoped they could do things. And so we're going to talk today about uh, three key points. First, experts are likely to provide biased estimates. Even experts are likely to provide estimates that are biased. Poor estimates, of course, are a root cause of program failure. And estimates can be better, squelching bias and strategic misestimation. And parametric models can help. We're going to talk mostly about the estimation processes, but, but uh, we'll talk about parametrics slightly. Now, first, what's an estimate? I always look at an estimate as the most knowledgeable statement you can make at a particular point in time regarding the effort, the cost, the schedule, the staffing, the risk, and reliability. And so by that definition, a well-formed estimate is a probability distribution. That means if I say that it's uh, 12 months and $3 million, I need to establish a probability, which is a 50% or a 60 or a 70% probability that it's that, that many months and that many dollars. And without that, estimates, estimates can go far, far awry. Even with that, they can go far awry. But, but not knowing the probability of your estimates is important. There's lots of methods of estimating. Uh, guessing is the most widely used method of estimating in the world, and uh, sadly, that's not even bias. Uh, estimation bias is often just off-the-cuff estimates that that are just uh, wrong. In fact, I, I've tried to figure out why people don't like to estimate, and it's really because they don't want to be proven wrong. Well, every estimate is wrong in some way. It's just a most, hopefully a good one is useful. You know, if it was exact, it would be called accounting, not estimating. Analogies, looking at past projects and uh, and figuring out how this project might compare, that can be very powerful. Expert judgment, once again, experts are often uh, biased themselves, usually biased themselves. Top down, you estimate the whole system, break it down into more detail until you get uh, parity between two levels. Bottoms up, take all the different uh, components of a system and, uh, and estimate them individually and add them up. Uh, it sounds like it's a really good thing, but unfortunately, it often goes awry as well because if you're estimating something that has labor in it, uh, it often misses uh, misses components of the labor and other other issues. Uh, uh, cost estimating relationships and parametric models can help estimating so long as you use them well and don't include estimating bias in your own inputs. Now, there's an article in the Harvard Business Review that, that discover, discusses this uh, uh, some of these issues. And uh, it goes back to the uh, the Nobel Prize winning research of uh, Kahneman and uh, and uh, some other people. Anyway, what they found was that humans are hardwired to be optimists. We're hardwired to be optimists no matter what. And uh, most of us, we all know somebody who's kind of a grump who is always a total pessimist, but most of us are hardwired to be optimists. They hypothesized perhaps that's because back in the old days, you know, if you tried to you know, kill your food and you missed, you had to go on and do it again. Anyway, people who routinely exaggerate the benefits and discount the costs. This causes problems both on the estimating side and the business case side, where often the costs are underestimated and the, uh, the uh, return on investment is well overestimated. Well, the solution suggested here is, is temper it by an outside view. Provide some kind of past measurement results or forecasting, risk analysis, and st or statistical parametrics. Another way to look at the problem so that you've got a, uh, a, a something to bounce it off of. Now, the, one of the keys here is to not remove any optimism. We don't want everybody to be all pessimistic all the time and get all the 99.9% .9 probability estimates, you know, the sky is falling, but to balance optimism with realism. Now, optimism and uh, and uh, uh, is is always an issue. So is short sightedness. Sightedness, uh, for example, here's a few of the uh, interesting short sighted statements. Uh, Bill Gates in 1981 said 640k ought to be enough for anybody. He was making excuses as to why uh, uh, Windows couldn't handle the full uh, the full megabyte of memory. Uh, one of my other favorites uh, on the bottom right: uh, to throw bombs from an airplane will do as much damage as throwing bags of flour. It would be my pleasure to stand on the bridge of any ship while it's attacked. Oops, a little short-sighted there. Uh, this can feed in. Even going into the in, into the current times, uh, Norman Schwartz, Schwarzkopf said that uh, war is not a Nintendo name. Nothing's going to be fought by robots. And uh, it was interesting. We had a wedding in my home this weekend, and somebody, I don't know who, was flying a little UAV with a uh, 
a GoPro camera on it and watching our wedding from afar. We never figured out who it was, uh, but that could have been uh, could have been looking at something really strategic in a in a military sense. Here's part of the problem. You know, if you look at a at a at a, at a, at a requirement, there's a scope. How much stuff you got to do. There's the resources you have to do it and the schedule you have to do it in. And then in the middle is quality. Uh, if you if you have to do it uh, quicker, quality goes down. Uh, sometimes people use what we call the exhaustive rule of testing. You test it till you run out of time and money, and then you ship it, independent of if it's uh, ready or not. Another way to look at that is you can have it faster, you can have it cheaper, but uh, to have it good and faster and cheaper uh, becomes very difficult. Usually you need to pick two uh, to get it faster, better, and cheaper. Now, of course, there, there are ways you can use things like commercial off-the-shelf software or, or uh, or off-the-shelf hardware and things, but generally, part of the problem is ignoring the realities of projects and that things uh, things go wrong. We need to manage all the issues. Now, if you look at the planning fallacy, this is part of the work that won the Nobel Prize. Uh, what they found is that judgment errors are systematic and predictable, not random. Predictable. We should be able to. We can predict that people are going to make errors in judgment, that they're going to manifest bias, not just confusion. That even the experts are going to make errors as well as lay people. And errors continue even when the estimators are aware of the nature of the errors. Now that's interesting. Even when we know that uh, that we we're, we make errors, we still have the bias. I remember once in my career reviewing a an estimate from uh, from someone and I'd had a, a a substantiation of the estimate or actually non-substantiation. It showed that the estimate was off by orders of magnitude. And when I showed that to the uh, people that had done the estimate, they just said, I just know we can do this for that amount. Of course, they were wrong, but, but they really believed that they could do it. They were, uh, they were systematic in their, in, their, in their judgment. And optimism is, is often due to overconfidence and ignoring risk or uncertainty, underestimating the cost, overestimating the benefits. Part of the root cause of this, they identified, was that people consider a, every new venture as unique rather than looking at things that are similar with prior ventures. They use an inside view focusing on the components of the problem rather than the outcomes of, of similar completed problems. I was just reading recently a study that uh, talked about a group that was doing a, an estimate for building a new course in a textbook. And uh, this, was a, this was a group of people building things in a the, in the similar vein to what, uh, what we're talking about. And they had, a, they had estimated that they could get this all done in two years. When they went back and looked at uh, other people's uh, uh, successes uh, typically it was seven to ten years for what they were doing, but they just knew they could do it in two until they went back and and uh, looked at their own fallacies. Now, if you look at reasons for poor estimating, a technical inadequate data or models. If it was all technical, then we ought to see relatively uh, uh, smooth distributions. Psychological people estimating bias that, that really make, makes them believe things are wrong, which would skew the uh, skew things, and and political and economic. You all know the problem. Somebody says, uh, I, I need this done in uh, two years and in, uh, for $6 million. What's your estimate? Well, in that case, if your estimate isn't two years and $6 million, the, you know, the answer is usually, oh, well, we'll find somebody else who can, who then fails. Now, there's lots of examples of this. This is kind of an interesting one. When they were building a tunnel from, uh, from the UK to, to, the, to Europe, the actual costs were about 200% of the estimates. The actual benefits were about half, and the uh, net present value was about se uh, minus 17.8 billion pounds. It costs about uh, uh, 17.8 billion pounds more than it was going to return, and uh, that should be actual IRR, not ITT. But uh, bottom line of this was that uh, they had estimated poorly. Now it's interesting. I gave this briefing uh, somewhere in Europe, and they said, "Well, Dan, you're missing one key point." The original estimates were over twice as much. They were told to cut them because it wasn't uh, cost effective with the uh, with the estimates they had. Well, they cut their estimates, and here's what happened: is a disaster. Now, Refletz class forecasting is part of the part of the work that came again out of this Nobel Prize and some other work, and they have, they, they suggested that the best predictor of performance is actual performance of implemented comparable projects. That provides an outside view. In other words, if you're going to build a new system. Uh, look at uh, what happened in, in similar systems that were built before. Now, it's not just a simple analogies, but, in that, but, but, but analogies are, are good things to start. Reference cast for, class forecasting attempts to force the outside view and eliminate the optimism. 
So choosing the reference class or analogous projects that are completed, compute the probability distribution of those, and then compare the range of the new projects estimates to the, to the completed projects. Now, collecting data is, uh, is always interesting. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, two factions here, even at Gallarath. One faction says, boy, it's the data, but we better make sure it's right, or at least viable. You know, arguably no data is perfect, but at least viable. And some say it's the data, it must be right. And uh, we go through this every time. We have to go through and we have to uh, look at the data, make sure the data makes sense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this uh, uh, particular guy in uh, 1840 suggested he was, uh, he was a tax collector. And he said the government is extremely fond of amassing great quantities of statistics. These are raised to the nth degree. The cube roots are extracted and the results are arranged in elaborate and impressive displays. But he's, and this is looking at uh, the things recorded by the village watchmen about problems in the, in, the, in the villages. But he said the bottom line, though, is it's all based on what the village watchman wrote down, and he writes down anything he pleases. So using bad data and coming up with, uh, with wonderful models for it uh, is risky as well. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't worth it. So part of the point here is watch out for data. Now here's a, here's a slide from, uh, from Boeing who looked at their ability to estimate before they had data and, and after they had data. And uh, this is really pretty much reference class forecasting. You can see on the left, without historical data, they were, they were doing pretty poorly, uh, uh, plus 20 to minus 145. With historical cost data, this is Boeing information systems, they were able to get their, their estimates within plus or minus 20%. They were quite pleased. Now, here's uh, an, um, plotting of the results of estimate versus actual. The US government collected a database called the SRDR data, and it's, it's software data. And they collected the initial estimates for size, this is in lines of code in this example, compared to the, uh, compared to the actuals. So the early estimates of size compared to the actual size. And now the analyst that put together the slide deleted the gross mis misestimation because otherwise the scale would have been so bad. But notice even in this scale, you know, one thing was 800% off. Typically they end up in, in one to 200 to 300% more size than, uh, than the original estimates. Now the same is true for estimating function points or almost anything. People's early estimates are optimistic. Ways to mitigate that is to look at actuals and look at the differences. And there's the issue of correlation. Now this is a very interesting. The, uh, this shows the correlation of the per capita consumption of cheese in the, in the United States and the number of people who died becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Um, 0.94 correlation. And uh, that's really good. The only trouble is there, there's no causation. The cheese and the bed sheets don't go, go together. We have, need to be careful in this when we're looking at, uh, at models and estimates as well. And here's more looking at data. Here's an example that red point is uh, historical projects between 230 and 300 function points for a financial system built within 10 years. Well, here's some more information. Uh, uh, now we see the projects that were descoped canceled or overrun as well. If we look at just the successful projects, it doesn't look so bad. If we look at these, you know, we've got a little more, a little more uh, suspicion. So we need to be careful of people that are cherry picking the, the data. Here's an example. This is out of our SEER model of, of uh, SEER plotting an estimate versus reference class classes. So you can see here, here's the estimate from, uh, from SEER SEM. Here's another estimate. So this is basically the range of uh, SEER estimates. Here's, uh, here's historical data points. And uh, here's trend lines, et cetera. Notice that the, the likely estimate is probably somewhere close to the middle. But it looks like it might be a little optimistic. So that doesn't mean SEER did a bad job. It, but it does mean the parameters, the input parameters, ought to be looked at again and verify that they're, that, that they're viable. Another example of uh, return on investment. Remember, uh, the study showed that uh, people both underestimate the costs and overestimate the benefits. Using the, the traditional uh, definitions of return on investment and net present value, internal rate of return, uh, can help. In this example here, this is a system that, uh, that uh, uh, has a net present value of $60,000. They're going to spend 100000 The internal rate of return is 13 uh, uh, 13, 13.5%. Uh, uh, That's as if it, I misstated the, the uh, total revenue here, 600,000. So basically, this is saying that uh, that uh, you're going to make 630, uh, 
$60,500 on this, roughly, the net present value. It's uh, as if you invested your money at 13.5%, and that'll give you 121% uh, return on investment. That sounds pretty good. If you apply risk here, we can see a little bit uh, different story where the return on investment may not be as good. So applying these techniques to, to both uh, cost and to benefits is, is really important in making viable business decisions. Now here's another factor in, 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 that, that comes into play here. We talked about people being optimists, and that's true. Let's take it down to a very, very, very small level. Let's suppose that we're managers and we're managing uh, two-week tasks. And we ask people for estimates of, uh, of, uh, of, these, of these small tasks. And we, we suggest to them that uh, they, need to, they need to give us an estimate. Well, let's think about it for a minute. Let's suppose you're the, you're the, you're the, uh, the technical person who's doing this small, small thing, maybe two, three, four weeks, and we ask you for an estimate. Everybody wants to be credible. Nobody wants to look bad in front of their peers. Uh, some people look bad every day, but, um, but they don't intend to be. So let's suppose now we're going to give an estimate to our, within our team. Well, if we think something's going to take two weeks, but it could take as much as three, we're probably going to estimate three, because if we estimate two and come in three, well, we're not credible, right? We did a bad job. And then what if we, so if we estimate three, but then we get done a, a week early, we go back and say, look, I'm done early. Well, now they think we were sandbagging. This estimate might get, might get uh, cut. So part of the issue is uh, how do you deal with this? And the way to deal with this is to uh, have a culture where it's okay to be under as well as over within reason in, in, in small, small tasks. Many organizations, though, just say that uh, give us your estimate and meet it. That actually makes projects take longer as people estimate the, the higher probabilities intuitively and then, uh, and then uh, just work to that. I get extra, might do extra, extra work. I know I used to share an office back early in my career, a guy that would just goof off most of the time until it got near the deadline, then he'd work hard. Now we talked about reference class forecasting and estimation bias. Uh, we can we can use models to compare existing programs to, to new programs to get an even better even better uh, estimate. So an example here: the blue dots are reference items. We know these; these are the actual; these are our reference classes. The red dots are our are our, our uh, unknowns. And there's two programs that do this. There's a program called Expert Choice, which is pretty well known. And then CR estimate by comparison does it. This is covering CR estimate by comparison. So we have the, the people doing the estimates say, well, I think this is about the same. I think it's a little higher, a little smaller, a lot bigger, a lot smaller. And, uh, and they can even put a range of how, how much bigger or smaller they think it is. What happens when we do that, when we use those references, we actually uh, have a baseline. And the baseline is, is reality. Now, if the data is good and we've used references, People are a lot better at estimating things relatively than from scratch. Uh, for example, if I asked to estimate the size of a building, a three-story building, we used to do these, these all the time. People can't do it very well. If I tell them the building next to it is 100 feet, they can do it while well, it's a little more, a little less. So that's a good way to, to apply. Whether you use expert choice or see your estimate by compare or, or do it yourself, uh, comparing uh, knowns to unknowns and having multiple people do it can be very powerful. Here's a... Uh, Here's a plot of what happens when we use the, the CR estimate by comparison. Now, we can see that it's generally within about 10% of, 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 of actuals. Now, if we get really crazy and, and put things out, we can see uh, 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 crazy numbers. But if people are using a reasonable approach and have any, con any confidence at all in what the system is, uh, it can be quite accurate. We've actually done studies where we've had uh, program managers do, do the estimates by comparison. We've had uh, secretaries do it. Etc. And even when program managers are trying to force a bias of, of, of optimism, you know, uh, if they're still being honest, uh, it, it comes out pretty well. And of course, a, a secretary or someone who has no basis for this won't get very good answers. That shows more out here. Also, lacking inconsistent, inconsistency can be can be interesting. You know, if A is greater than B and A is greater than C, that's consistent. Well, if A is greater than B and A is less than C. Obviously, that's inconsistent. Now, it might be right. In your best best judgment, it might be right. But it's good to know when you're doing comparisons if you have inconsistencies, not saying that they, that they should be adjusted necessarily, but trying to help people estimate the best they can, providing a, and flagging those inconsistencies can be very valuable. Now, Expert Choice does this. The CR Estimate by Compare does this. And I'm sure people have spreadsheets and other ways to do this as well. 
looking at biases, the UK actually publishes a, uh, a ranges of estimation bias, and you can find this on the web. And this particular one was for, for a number of things. If you look at the bottom one, it's uh, equipment and development. They actually say that there's a, uh, a bias of 54% in, uh, in the estimates of, uh, of uh, equipment and development, and uh, up to 200% in, uh, in uh, capital expenditure. So outsourcing, about 41%. People are often estimated about 41% low. Interesting. So this is actually, they, they, they did this based on a number of uh, many, many projects to try to figure out where the biases were and how to adjust them. And they call that the Green Book. Again, it's available on the web. But uh, the Green Book process, one, decide which projects to use, the reference class. Two, assume it's the worst case. Start at the upper bound. Uh, rather than assuming it's the best case, start at the upper bound and the worst case. And three, consider whether optimism bias factor can be reduced. Is there something that says we can make this estimate less? Four, apply that. And five, uh, review the adjustment. So they actually have a process where bias has been quantified and uh, and you can adjust adjust your estimates based on that. There's five levels of risk management as well. Level one, opinions. You know, I think it's going to be this, I think it's going to be that. Nah, better than nothing, but not so good. There is a, even if they're as unbiased as possible, they're still not as good. Level two, benchmarking, comparing to something viable. That's a good thing as well. Level three is actually doing due diligence, digging in, in addition to the comparison, and looking at what might, might be right, what might be wrong, where things might be, might be off, et cetera. Level four is using serious, uh, serious uh, rigorous estimating, reference class forecasting, parametric modeling, uh, estimates by comparison. Level five, full risk management and looking for black swan mitigation. Black swans are, are the things that go wrong that people never would have thought going wrong. So this is five levels of risk management that should be applied to estimating. Now, Joe Hamaker, who uh, at one time was the head of, head of cost at NASA, is now at Gallarat, said that, that there's a myth that the more details, the better the estimate. If a 100 element W work breakdown structure is good, then a 1,000 must be better, and 10 should be smeared at, sneered at, and if it's parametric, it's even worse. On the contrary, if someone wants to know the cost and the cost of the project, the details are counterproductive, and parametric estimating is the preferred choice. Here's part of what he what, what he found: parametric estimates are top down; they're 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 quicker. They have easier trade-offs. Uh, they uh, are more disciplined. The bottoms up or detail estimates take more time. The trade-off need details. The performance standards. Uh, a lot of things can go wrong. People can be estimated. Um, people can be optimistic or 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 pessimistic at the root level. And the worst part is they forget things. Uh, uh, the things that didn't end up in the work breakdown structure or everything being being a best case uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottoms up estimate. Now, some people say, well, bias is, uh, is true, but, 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 but it's not everywhere. It's not, it doesn't permeate everything. Here's a study that was done at JPL. And here's the deal. They had a dinner party and we had a stir fry, a salad, fresh bread, apple pie, and coffee. The guests left, and uh, it's time to clean up. The dishwasher broke. So you got to hand wash all the dishes, the silverware, and the pots. you got to put them in a drying rack. They've been randomly stacked in the sink for a couple hours, but no food is burned on. So you got to clean all the stuff, the plates, the dessert plates, the salad tongs, all this stuff. you got a sponge, a scrub brush, a dishwashing soap, and hot, cold water. Here's the question. How long? Now, some people say this isn't really a, a good example because everybody uses a dishwasher. I don't know. I, I got to admit, I only wash dishes twice a year, either way. But uh, here's what they wanted to do: they wanted to test the impact, impacts of anchoring, giving people a number, and seeing how that biased their estimates of mismatches of the question and answer, the, uh, using proper estimation language, how it worked if we decomposed the problem, uh, how to deal with reserves or risk or uncertainty. And the planning fallacy, you know, can we get you know, are people going to be optimistic or, or are they going to include risk? Well, there are five, 507 people that is 142 JPLers, uh, 305 college students, and 60 other adults. So they had about 2,300 data points collected in this. Uh, my guess is the uh, college students probably did more manual dishes than the JPLers. So, number one, how easily can be, people be influenced by the wrong answer, the anchor? So the anchor said, 
uh, the estimate, estimate how many minutes it will take for you to clean the kitchen. One person said it would take about 10 minutes to fish, finish cleaning up. Of course, he might be wrong, but please give us your estimate. In that case, the, uh, uh, the nominal estimate was 30 minutes. The anchored estimate was 25 minutes. The best case estimate was 27 minutes. It was only two minutes longer than the anchored estimate. The conclusion was that if we give these kind of numbers, it skews the, it skews the estimate. Now, let's suppose we said, gee, I'd like you to come in around $6 million. What are you going to do? I have a target of 400000 for you. The last robot arm cost $7 million. All these things can go into as anchors as well. So anchoring, at least in this little study, uh, can cause people to, uh, to misestimate towards the anchor. Generally, that anchor is optimistic. Question and answer mismatch. Uh, different, different participants were asked, you know, how many minutes will it take to clean the whole kitchen? Uh, what's the whole kitchen mean? You know, there's a 50, and then they were asked probabilities. Right, give me a 50% and a 75 and a 90% probability. So people have to now factor in probability in their in their own minds. And people interpret nominal to be 50% means you'll exceed the estimate half the time. But uh, the manager may have a once a more reliable result, 70 to 90% confidence. This is why I say a complete estimate should include the probability, not just the number. Well, more, more. The uh, the estimates range from 51 minutes first case, uh, worst case, 45 minutes for the 99% uh, probability, 30 minutes nominal, and 27 minutes for the best case. People ended up being skewed toward optimism. The nominal estimate was 10% longer than the best case, but 70% shorter than the worst case. Now people are optimistic, so it's easy to anchor them down. But anchoring, they could not get them to anchor up. They could give them bigger numbers and couldn't get people to to go up. Now one could say, well, they know the washing of the dishes and how long that takes. But uh, but still, anchoring caused things to vary. And here's a summary of the of the estimates uh, 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 with the anchor, with the worst case, with the uh, breaking the problem down. It did a more detail. Didn't really help. You wash the knives and the forks, etc. Now, when we're talking about estimating, one of the areas people get in trouble a lot is definitions. Some people uh, uh, don't include don't include some things. Some people do include them. Some people don't define what is and isn't included. And, and some people get hung up and, and confused by cost versus price. You know, cost is what it costs. It's the labor, materials, the risk, and the other other direct costs. Uh, price includes business considerations such as profit, risk, etc. Now. So there, there are two different things, cost and price. Uh, price includes profit. Now, if you look at some of the examples, one of my favorite examples is the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, uh, people decided they had to redo the cables on the Golden Gate Bridge, those big, thick cables to hold the bridge up. And they got three estimates. The first estimate was uh, a gazillion dollars. The second estimate was similarly about a gazillion dollars to replace all these cables. You know, there's a lot of material, uh, a lot of labor, but uh, material's a big cost. The third estimate was dramatically lower. And initially, they thought to throw out the third estimate is, is, is not compliant. The people didn't, didn't understand the problem. But then they went back and said, well, let's just check this out. And they went back to number three and said, how is it you're going to do this for so much less than anybody's ever done it before? And uh, the answer was that this particular group had a plan. They were going to take the pieces of the cable, saw them into small pieces, mount them on a board, and sell them as a piece of the Golden Braid Bridge to tourists. So we're able to lower the, the, the cost and uh, have a significant return on investment. Uh, they end up getting the job, and you probably, somebody you know has one of those little pieces of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, price varies. You know, look at, uh, at cars. You know, if you buy a car the last day of the month, or, or well, it can be different. Uh, anyway, cost is different than price. Now, Hubbard, the book, uh, uh, how to Measure Anything is one of his books, and he's got several others. He's one of my favorite authors in the world. And uh, he said that really the issue is that if we can reduce uncertainty, something's valuable. Even if it's uncertain, if we, if we can reduce uncertainty, that is hugely valuable. And he says that uh, a quantitatively expressed reduction in uncertainty is, is worth doing more work and more estimation. Here you can see the, the uh, dark blue is a probability before measurement or before doing some kind of a, a better forecasting. The blue one, is, the light blue one, is after. And so, and I, th and I believe he's correct. If we can reduce the range of the uncertainty, we can reduce risk in, in many ways, and it's worth spending time to do that usually. Now, here's an example again from Hubbard. 
he went back and asked people about the uh, about their estimates. He found people were overconfident, confident, especially educated professionals. When he asked uh, Harvard trivia, Harvard MBAs for uh, for answers, they got about 40% correct. The target was 90. Uh, when he went to the chemical company, I think this is more interesting. The chemical chemical company employees, he asked them about the industry in general, they got about 50% right. He asked them about company specific things, they got 48% right. They did. Uh, scary. These are the people that were were big big in the company and knew the company. And uh, and, it, and it, it goes on. And his point here is you can actually teach people to be better estimators, to reduce the uncertainty, and to get within the range better. Uh, Hubbard also talks about how people are game gaming, uh, gunning for models. People don't want a model that's too complex. Models have error, and we shouldn't attempt it. Uh, we don't have sufficient data. It works, but we can't see the data, so we shouldn't use it, all these different things. And uh, uh, and he says that's wrong, that models are extremely valuable. And uh, obviously some models are bad, but any uh, viable models are extremely valuable. Uh, uh, George Box said essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's true, right? A model is, a, is, a, is an approximation. And uh, we saw, you know, if we're within 10%, we're pretty happy. Uh, any point goes on to point out some models are more useful than other. He also points out everyone uses a model, even if it's intuition or common sense. I always like to look at Costco. We used to call Costco the $100 store. We knew every time we went there we were going to spend $100. Now I think it's a $200 store. But but uh, but intuition says you walk into Costco, you're going to buy too much stuff. It's going to be stuff you didn't plan to buy. You know the you know, 30 pounds of, tie, of, dish, of dishwashing liquid instead of uh, a little thing you need. Anyway, uh, Box suggests that a model, quantitative or otherwise, should be preferred. Uh, over just expert judgment. Again, from uh, NASA, uh, David Graham showed us the uh, the reason of of cost growth in two space programs. This is development cost growth. And if you look at the uh, yellow piece, that was actually cost estimation issues, 25%. Other things, requirements changed. The budget and funding changed. Uh, they underestimated the risk. There were slips both on the government and the contractor side and there were price increases. So the estimation itself in their analysis was 25% of the uh, of, of the problem. 75% was other things. And poor estimates are root cause of project failure. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, estimates are the three key points. Estimates are likely uh, providing, uh, estimators are likely providing biased results. Your experts are probably giving you results bias, and they don't even mean to, usually. They're doing the best they can, but, but it's hardwired into us. Poor estimates cause failures in projects, root cause of project failures. Estimates can be better, squelching bias and strategic estimation. If you recognize these issues, try to use reference class forecasting, parametric models like SEER can help.